Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's worthy of praise. Glory to God. I was uh, thinking about, you know, that God has put His life, His resurrection life inside of a people and that seed, that life, has been instructed or, you know, when we, when we were reading the other day about uh, when the Holy Ghost came and and uh, he impregnated Mary and, and then uh, Joseph, you know, he he had to deal with some things, didn't he? And, and, and as he was dealing with those things that the Lord had given him a dream and out of that... Uh, you know, Jesus was born. You know, the the, the seed wasn't uh, aborted along the way. It wasn't, uh, you know, didn't take a different path. And and I think the thing that's really cool about all that, if if we can really understand this, is that that when God poured out that Spirit, the Holy Ghost, that there was a determination, right? The determination. Like in Jesus, right, it was that he would bring that seed to full maturity. In other words, it would bring forth an expression of an invisible God. It was determined. And the caretaker, if I can use that term, was the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, he, told, he said this to us, you know, he, he, he's like, I have to go so the comforter can come. And I, one of the things that, the, that we really need to learn and we really need to understand is that the Holy Ghost didn't come to do our will. He only came to do the will of the Father. You know, He didn't come to do any other thing than to preside over the seed that the seed would mature and bring forth fruit. And as much as he did that with Jesus, the preeminent, the firstborn, the first fruit, he has determined, same assignment, it will be accomplished. No, it will get done. That there will be a people that see the fruit, the full fruit, of the seed. There's there's no doubt about it. And so with that, you know, and and we we have to come to this understanding like we we say a lot of phrases and verses, you know, we and but we we need to really like you know, meditate on them and you know and and uh, think on them in the concept, you know, of what he really is trying to get you and I to understand and uh, he, he has determined, he really has determined to make sure that his purpose is fulfilled. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He never in any way, shape or form ever wanted anything else. He never wanted even what we call church. It was never his ideology. <laughs> it wasn't his philosophy. It was man's. Like God uses it to a certain degree to work through it, but it was never the destination. The destination always was for humanity to be the habitation. Know ye not that you are the temple of God. I think it's pretty cool in that same area there in Corinthians, he, he says this, look, the body was made for the Lord. That's what it was made for. So that He could inhabit it, not according to man's religious will, but according to God's perfect will. This is what he had determined. 
This is what he speaks of when he says abundantly above. This life works in us to bring about the reality that he doesn't live in places or things made with human hands. He came to dwell in people. Yeah, it's that simple. But you and I, we also have a responsibility and, and, and an accountability. We'll be accountable. Every, every human being will be accountable for it uh, in one way, shape, or of another. And that is that God has invited humanity. This is exactly why He is patient. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. That no one would perish, but that every... Mankind, or all of mankind, would do what? Turn to Him. Repent. This isn't, you know, we hear the word repent, we see the word repent, and we leave it in the category of, you know, uh, outer court or middle court or, you know, Passover. That's where most of it is left, is in Passover. Uh, Not even a real Spirit-filled experience in Pentecost But the reality is, is God wants a booth, a house. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, dwelling places, rooms. Rooms. This is what God has determined. And so He gave us the seed of Christ. It's not, you know, it's not just a little bit of God. It's all of God. Every bit of God. And it, ta- it will take the working of the Holy Ghost. It, he worketh in us, right? To bring about the fullness in expression. See, there, there's really, you know, sometimes we, we talk about this, but this is really where we have to understand the maturing and the growing up is in expression. Manifestation. Fruit, profit, wealth, all those things that we can relate to when it comes to the economy and money. But the reality is, is he's after the economy that never comes to an end. It's nothing but surplus. There's no debt. It's been paid. It's been paid. So you and I, we have to appropriate. We have to pr- appropriate. And I think appropriate is it's a pretty it's a pretty cool word. It's a, you know it's it's kind of funny you know like um, we it's spelled exactly the same way appropriate and appropriate, right? It's spelled exactly the same way, um, but one is an adjective and one is a verb. No, I'm not trying to give you an English lesson, but the cool thing about Uh, appropriate being a verb that means you and I have to put some action to it and the action has to be by the spirit through the Holy Ghost you know we can't um, you know I think this is a pretty good thing to understand that you and I must be co-laborers with God you know is God the pilot or the co-pilot yes Right, God's my co-pilot. Remember those bumper stickers way back? You probably don't remember them. You guys know they they used to be, and finally people got rid of them because people were always fighting over them about who the pilot was and who the co-pilot was, because this is what Christians do. They just do, because it's the heart of the nature of always, you know. But anyway, but we must appropriate. Be a co-laborer with him. We must put on. We must put off. And I think it's pretty cool that the word appropriate, literally this is what it means. It means to take something for one's own use. Now it's interesting. It says typically without the owner's permission. But that says typically. But we have the owner's permission. Okay? It means to seize. Lay hold of. 
all that He is for the eternal purpose of God. And so, in doing that, there has to be a, 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 you know, a laying hold of a apprehending, a seizing of not just the moment, but the life. That putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is really what God is after, is for you and I to put it on. He paid the price. Well, how do I put it on? How do I put it on? Like, getting religious won't do it. It just won't. But being a sluggard won't do it either. It just won't. What God's trying to get you and I to do is to mature. Like, like uh, I know probably about this time of the year, like if you have a garden, you kind of get tired of weeding it and all that kind of stuff, and the weeds are probably starting to, you know, it's like, especially if the fruit doesn't seem like it's coming along too well or the way you thought when you planted it, but uh, be of good cheer. <laughs> God knows what he's doing. He certainly does. And so God is after you and I to appropriate, to apprehend, to lay hold, to grasp. Walk with Him in everyday life. And I think about this all the time. I woke up the other morning, I don't know, it was like 2.52 in the morning. When I say it was like it, it was. <laughs> so it was 2.52 in the morning when I woke up and I started talking to the Lord and started praying. And I, I think about this verse in Romans chapter 13. I, I say it all the time, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a, more to the verse. So you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because anything to do with the sensual realm, the material, natural realm, we live in it, but it's a temporary life. Look, if you're a believer or not a believer, it's a temporary life. It will come to an end. But God has submitted, offered a better life. A much better life. Eternal life. And He didn't give it to us for some day. He gave it to us so that we can appropriate right now. 365 years, Enoch walked with God. Elijah, walk with God. Elisha, walk with God. The Son, Jesus, walked with the Father, God. They appropriated, they put on. Moses did the same thing. We saw them in the Mount of Transfiguration. They came to a place where they had put on, appropriated everything that God had determined for a temple, for a house, for a people. And this same God in the 21st century with the height of humanism, human wisdom, human desire, human everything. You know, I was, saw a commercial the other day and they, where would we be if, uh, you know, there was never a Henry Ford, a Thomas Edison, uh, a Boeing, and they were listing all these people. And I'm like, dudes, don't you know God would have just used somebody else if they were never born? It was God who determined all the technology. It was God who made life much easier for mankind so that he would not ever just have an excuse, but more importantly, not have to toil so hard so that he could spend all of his time seeking, finding the Lord. We have gardens today because it's a novel idea. Well, you certainly don't need one. Well, you get better food. He already told you, don't take any thought for what you eat. Now see, that flies right in the face of our understanding because of what we tend to listen to and feed on and what he's trying to get you and I to appropriate. The only reason we get nervous, I'll use that term lightly, is because what if? And because we see the results sometimes even in people we didn't think it would ever happen to. But it never changes. God's determination for mankind to be a temple. 
And I mean, we do like to say it, right? We do, we do like to declare it. Not life, not death. 17 things in that portion of Scripture can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Selah. Take a moment and think about it. That God has chosen us, invited us for the high calling. The most high calling. There is no other calling. The high calling. And the high calling is in a place. It's a person. It's a real life living inside of us. We can't live from the perspective of the sensual. That's wisdom from below. Always satisfying the natural man. And God's trying to get you and I to understand the only thing that will live is the spirit man. Real simple. Real easy. Appropriate. Put on. This is what God is after. To seize the day. To seize the life. Because in the day, like like I, I sent you guys that little text the other day, in that day, well that day already exists. Shall this song be sung in the land of Judah? A land of overcomers, first fruit people, victorious. You know, we always, you know, the the cool thing is uh, about Judah, it literally means celebrated, so immediately we think of praise, which I, I'm not opposed to that. Or, but the truth of the matter is, if you are victorious, if you won the game, what do you do? You celebrate. Do you know why most Christians can't celebrate? They don't know that they won. Our victory was secure. He did it. I don't have to do a thing except for co-labor with him and appropriate what he has already won. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It's that real. That no matter what goes on in this life, he is victorious. If we determine his victory based upon our circumstances and our lifestyles and all those kind of things, we will surely feel like we have not won the race that he has already won. This is why he tells you don't faint, don't faint, don't become weary. Don't get wore out. We don't see everything under his feet, but we see Jesus. We don't see the corporate man standing in the earth, but we know for a fact. Facts. You want facts? Facts. Jesus has already won. And that life, that seed, is inside of us. Not a little bit, All of him. Like I told you, you take that tomato plant or that tomato seed or whatever you want, whatever one it is, I don't care what it is, and you plant it in the ground, it will produce another tomato. Yeah, it's like crazy, isn't it? No, seriously, it's like crazy. I think a lot of times we just take a lot of things for granted. We don't think about them. We don't meditate on them. Ah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's, uh, let's, I don't know where I want to read. I, I have, I'm, I'm not even going to maybe spend a lot of time tonight um, because I want to talk about appropriating. Appropriating. I mentioned it a little bit the other day. Let's turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 4.
Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Chapter 4. I was, as I was getting ready, and I don't know why, well, you know, we had the storm and everything, and, and uh, it got really dark, and, uh, and it got really windy and, and everything, and uh, I started to sing a song, come to my table, sit at my table, and the whole time I was looking at the scriptures for the last few days, you know, the song didn't come to me at all, but at that moment it came to me, that God is looking for people who will come to the table. Now the table has been spread. The victory is ours, says the Lord. Right? And so then it becomes yours and my, our responsibility to appropriate or to eat from that table. So that life can be nourished. That expression can be released. This is what God is after. And as I, you know, and, and, and I, I probably, I, I'd like to, um, I, I mentioned it the other day, I talked about the teeth, you know, the teeth. You know, we, we have teeth, you know, like it just, we don't, we, we almost take them for granted at times because they're just, they're there, right? And, and everything. But primarily, what are the teeth for? I mean, I mean, their 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 functional use is to chew, right? It's to eat, it's it's to you know, it's to eat something. It's to to break the food up so you can swallow it. You know, it, it's not like those uh, seagulls that can swallow a penguin whole. Don't even ask me how they did that. I I, I have no idea, but it's crazy. Teeth, though, right? Teeth. To eat. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to eat. Not everything, but I like to eat. Now, if it's sweet, I usually like to eat everything. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a different story. But, uh, but the Bible says this. It says, strong meat belongs to those that are what? Mature. Which implies that you have to have teeth. I mean, you have to have teeth to eat. If you back up a verse or two in there, he said, look, he said, you ought to be teachers and still needing, instead of still needing to be taught. Right? That they'd rather milk. Milk. To live on milk. And, and I know that a lot of times when we hear certain words and, you know, we have certain mindsets and we think all these things. But remember when Jesus said this to the disciples when, in John chapter 4, like, they looked and they are like, where did he get the food? Right? Because like, he said, look, I have meat. Didn't he say that? Here, I don't, want to, I don't want to misquote. I might have it right here. I think I might. Yeah, he, he, I do. He said, I have meat to eat. I have to sit down because I just heard it in a way I never heard it before. It goes right along with, look, eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard. Everything is in the seed. Well, I already know that. I have meat to eat that you know not of. Say la. Pause and think of that. And it's going to take teeth. It's going to take an appropriating, a laying hold, a seizing. 
I think about this all the time. I, I can always hear Steve saying it because he always would kind of like repeat it, you know, when we did the sacrifices. But remember, the approach to God is what? Through sacrifice. It's going to cost us something. Does anybody know what it's going to cost us? Everything. It's going to cost us our life. We cannot be like Ananias and Sapphira and hold back our portion. It doesn't matter if it's your time, your talent, your treasures, your mindsets, your... If you, if you or I have any area of our life where we're willing to hold it back, it's just a spirit of being a taker and not a giver. Because what God wants to do is release, give. The creation groans, not for a bigger church, not for more ministry, better music. The creation groans to see God in a people. And God has determined, whether we like it or not, He has determined that there will be a Remnant, a light, a man child, a people, a first fruit, a Judah, an overcomer. They are light, true light. Don't talk about it, they just are. Light in the midst of darkness. They're a new cruise filled with fresh salt. They're the answer. God has determined. It's the incarnation of Himself in humanity. He's determined it. I have meat to eat that you know not of. We have to appropriate, seize, lay hold, go after. And what are the ways to do that, right? As as God gives us His Word, like you remember the story David said, I will do what? Meditate on Thy Word. When? Day and night. You've heard me say it a million times probably. I always remember the message my dad shared years and years and years ago that the word meditate conjures up the picture like a cow chewing the cud. Chew it, swallow it down, bring it back up. (laughs) Not saying, well, I already tasted that once. I already heard that once. I already know that. I already understand that. No, I have meat to eat. Can I use the word again? Afresh. A new. Meditate on the word. And as we meditate on his word, right? It will cause our minds, our hearts, our lives to be clean. We do become what we feed on. Like, I'm not going to deny for one moment that if all you ever ate was, you know, salty treats and sugary treats, that at some point you might not have an issue. Okay? I mean, even the Bible says this. Don't eat too much honey or you're going to do what? Throw up. But he wasn't really talking about food. God gave us this life to enjoy, didn't he? Isn't that that what the Bible says? And if we take that too far, so meditate on his word. 
It will clean and wash the brain. I, I, I always laugh, you know. I, I remember, like, this was like a long, 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 long time ago. And I can remember when I was, uh, when Sherry sat next to me at work, like, this was like in 04. And I said, yeah, I'm all about brainwashing. <laughs> Do you remember that? Brainwash. Now, we don't like that term, but God does. God wants to wash the brain. And the thing that He wants to wash off is all the dirt of Adam. Tommy Tinney wrote a book, and I always quote one portion of that book because I've never forgotten it. It was like, it was right straight directly to the heart. The reason most folks aren't hungry for God is junk food for the soul and entertainment for the flesh. They'll spend all their time as a glutton and a drunkard, making their lives feel good when all along God has called us, invited us to the high calling, to be an expression, a light, a true light, not artificial, not man-made. Most Christians are man-made light. It's knowledge and no life. Ananias, Sapphira, always holding back what they say they'll give. And God is trying to get His people to awake. Awake in thy likeness. Awake in thy righteousness. Awake. Don't fall asleep and fall out a window. I, I, I always have said this, right? Like the only reason he fell out that third floor story, third story window, that third floor was because he was leaning in that direction. Yeah. Brainwashing, cleansing, clean the mind, chew the cud, meditate on God's word, and it will clean our lives. If we never, you know. And, like, I, I know you know this, and, and I'm, I'm just saying this because I want to read a verse and maybe we'll just go home, but uh, it's about the teeth. Because the, one of the cool things about teeth are, right, like, they have an ornamental value too, don't they? If we didn't think so, we wouldn't spend so much money on, you know, straightening them out. You know, in the old days, in my day, you know, it was like you had like uh, a honking piece of metal all around each individual tooth and wires as thick, thick as telephone cable and, and everything else, you know. And uh, now I never had to wear a, a head thing like this or anything like that. And, you know, and I, I, I say this tongue in cheek, uh, um, I was poor, so I had to wait till I had money to get them. So I was like 19 years old. You know, and so like everybody else, had, everybody else already had them. Like when I was getting them, most of the teeth, because in those days we didn't put them on kids when they were five years old, with, still with their baby teeth in them. But anyway, that's a whole different story. Everybody knows it's about this, right? But they're ornamental, aren't they? And we don't spend all of our time making them straight and white. For no reason at all. And, 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 you know, right, TV commercials that show the teeth or are about teeth, they even know how to artificially put a what? Sparkle in there for us. God wants to show off His glamour, His glory. Because when you're done eating, you want to make sure your teeth are clean and polished. To show forth the glory of who he is. So if you turn with me, I think I already said it. So the uh, Song of Solomon, I want to read. I'm going to read verse 1 and then I'll read verse 2 of chapter 4. Because I think this verse, and, and then what even got me over here is something. Maybe I'll just read it and not spend a lot of time there. and We'll just go home and, you know, talk. And... Can't eat a McDaddy unless I leave the nuts in there big, but we'll have one. 
Verse 1, Behold, thou art fair, my love. This is him talking to her. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove eyes with thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. This is now, she's beginning to understand, okay, who he is and who she is. See, we make a big deal about knowing who we are. But one of the problems she had was this. She only wanted him where she was. This is the way the church is right now. They're Pentecostal in their mindset. They're not even interested in tabernacles because Pentecostal is a duality realm. It's both man and God. Let me run out and lay my hands on everybody in the hospital and fix the problem. No, it will never fix the problem because what God is after is a house, a tabernacle, a family, a son, a booth that has put on, released, matured in everything of the seed. This is why, uh, you know, I, I was reading, you know, I don't know where I read, I was reading something about the instructions again. This is what I love about the instruction of the seed. The Father laid all the instructions in the seed. He wrote it in. He, he, he coded it in the life. That resurrection life must come forth. Can't fail. It's in humanity. It'll happen. No, no, it'll happen. Do you know how I know it'll happen? It already did. Never had anybody ever raised from the dead. Look. Oh, no, that's not true. Jesus raised people from the dead. No, 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 no. Lazarus died again. Nobody raised from the dead ascended to the Father and returned. Not to die again. Christ dieth no more. Verse 2. Here's my verse. Thy teeth. You know, it's like, thy teeth. Thy teeth are like. Okay? It's like. It's the like as principle. He didn't say that her teeth were a flock of sheep. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn. Okay? And you know what the word shorn means. It literally means clip. Now the interesting thing is this same verse primarily is over in chapter 6. Do you remember what happened in chapter 5? He came to her and she said, I've already, you know, I've already put off and I've already washed my feet and, you know, and I'm already a good Christian. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I've already done all this. And he put his hand in the door, left the fragrance, wanted her to come out. And by the time she got to the door, he had what? He had withdrawn. He had gone over. He had moved to another dimension, another place. The word is albar. It literally means to cross over. But this is before that took place. And if you remember, she went looking for him and asked all the Watchmen, all the preachers, all the Christians that thought they knew what was going on. Where is he? Have you seen? And all they did was what? Beat her up. That's what they did. Thy teeth, like a flock of sheep that are even shorn. 
Now, it's interesting about teeth because, like, for the most part, and I know I'm going to be probably, but the teeth pretty much, they picture the body of Christ. Each one being the same, like they're all, they're all you know, ivory, I guess, right? Right? And each one is specific for its location. It's a picture, a many-membered body. There's a certain amount. We also can liken that same thing to like the boards in Moses' church when they set them all up and put them in the sockets and they did all that kind of stuff. Aren't your teeth in a socket? Yeah, it's, it's the same picture. Okay? And the thing about sheep is what do they do with sheep? What's on sheep? Wool, right? And they like to shorn it or cut it, clip it. And what God's really trying to get you and I to understand here is this. When we meditate on His Word, He's clipping away the wool. Remember they couldn't wear wool garments? Yeah, like, it's like, like white linen is the garment of choice, isn't it? It's not wool. It's not toil, it's not sweat, it's not human understanding, it's not human wisdom, it's God's revelation, His revealing. Like, I'm not really, like, it's, it's, it's hard to say because our minds don't always uh, hear what the Spirit is saying. This is, this is why I like this. You know, the book of Revelation says, hear what the Spirit is saying. Right? God is giving us revelation in word to chew on to reveal the living word. So in other words, it's not just coded or DNA'd in us or written like a manual to try to follow it. See, we have two sides of that coin. Some people really try to persuade and pursue to live. And others just... But God is determined, I'll write it inside of you. So that it just comes out. So when you meditate, appropriate the word, meditate. Put action to it. The Holy Ghost, who presides over the whole environment, goes to work. Pretty simple. Because he's determined to build a house, a family. When the whole church world, I always think about this, and it's kind of cool because my brother Stephen's he, he literally is sharing this right now. But when the whole church world of he, Eli's church world, Samuel was the prophet, not one word fell to the ground while he was the prophet. And yet he was the prophet in Eli's system. And we know the story, but all along there was a cry. A cry. A cry for what? Fruit. Fruit. And that's what's cool about this. Look, thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, right? They've been clipped. They've been cut. That came up from the what? Washing. God's all about cleansing the mind. Cutting away the works of the flesh. Can I say this? Ass's head and dove's dung. Human wisdom and what God did yesterday. See, God never changes, but we have to. He never changes, but we have to. And how we have to change is we have to rotate into Him. They come up from the washing, 
and, and, and we know this, I, like th- this is why this whole verse is centered in this, talks about the teeth, eating the word, devouring the word. Remember what, look, if you go to Jeremiah, if you go, if you go to Ezekiel, look, if you go to Revelation in John, he said, eat the book, eat the scroll, eat the word. I think I have this verse somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. I, I'm just going to read this here. Uh, Jeremiah, the words were found, I did eat them. And thy word was to me the joy and rejoicing. You ever wonder why you're not happy? Unless you have to have something in the material world. The word made flesh brought joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. He ate the word. He ate the Word. John ate the Word, right? Ezekiel, I think it's like chapter 3, the first few verses, he said, eat the scroll. Eat the Word. Meditate. Day and night. It'll cut away the woolly garments, the flesh, so it can reveal the life, the seed. This is what, you know, it's really cool that Jesus, he had the seamless garment. One thread from top to bottom. No beginning, no end. Made of linen. A life that is righteous, white, pure, never comes to an end. He put that life inside of you. And he's trying to get you and I to appropriate that life. To put it on. Not fulfill the lust, the lust of the flesh. Yeah. They come up from the washing where every one of them bear twins and none of them are barren. Teeth, they're orderly. They're in order, right? That's why we straighten them out. Come on, they're crooked when they come in. Not everybody, but you get my point. They get in order, get straightened out, and they produce fruit. Twins. Now, I think it's kind of interesting. I don't think it's quite coincidental. Today's the 11th, and one of my favorite verses is Proverbs 11.1. 1. False balance. Is an abomination to the Lord, a, fault, a false balance, right? Is it a, a false scale? Is an abomination to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. And if we know what the word balance or scale is, what it means, if it, it literally means the ear. The ear, right? It has to be balanced. The word has to be balanced. It's like this, right? Well, I can't be saved by doing works. But works without faith is dead. Well, which one is it? You got to hear what the Spirit says to the people, the churches. See, this is one of the... This, this is one of the issues that we have that generates a lot of questions, carnal questions, I always like to call them, right? Is this, well, what is it? Which one is it? How come? We have to know Him. We have to hear the Spirit. It bears twins. Teeth bear twins. In other words, it knows how to speak right. knows how to... It releases. What's that? It's a duplicate. This is all God's ever wanted to do, is duplicate, if I can say it like that. It's just a picture. Duplicate the life inside of every one of us. All right? There's nothing lacking at his table. Nothing. It's brought forth, hasn't it?
Okay, I'm going to read this last thing. Turn with me to Genesis 49. This is actually what got me all going, it, uh, even looking at this, because I actually was looking at something else, and then I got looking at that, and, and uh, I think it was pretty cool, me personally. I think it was the right timing, so to speak, it's like, okay, we have this seed inside of us. We have this life inside of us. We all know that. And, and it doesn't just mean, look, it doesn't just mean inside this physical framework. It's in our whole environment that it needs to be released. He's in our midst. God is in our midst. What connects you, what connects you and I? Him. I hate to say this. I mean, I don't want to sound mean. I will, you know, I will to some, but, uh, you know, if, 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 it is always trouble to the flesh, right? And that's this. We will never have the relationship God wants unless it's 100% His Spirit. Because there can't be any division. It doesn't matter, like, it, it doesn't matter. Flesh and blood, flesh and blood, like, it's short-lived. We've never really understood this, that the love of the Spirit is way stronger, way better, and lasts forever. Not just longer, forever. Okay, here we go. Verse 8. Are you there? I think this is pretty good. Judah, now we all know that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But we also know that he's the firstborn of many brethren. He is the chiefest. He's white and ruddy. He's the chiefest among 10,000. He's after a family. Judah, Judah, right? Judah celebrated, overcomers, right? First fruit. Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Now, what's really cool about that is, oh, let me finish just reading this. That praise, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies, thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now, if we look at this just on the surface, like a lot of people have taken this and run with it. This is the whole reason of the whole... Um, Kings and priest mentality, right? But do you know what he's really saying here? Like if we look at it from the Father's point of view, Jesus, this is what he said, I'm going to have a victory that my nature will be inside of you. And I'm going to have a people that my nature can be in. Did you see that? What did it say? Thy Father's children. Yeah, the offspring of don't even your poets say you are the, we are the, what? Offspring of God. I hope I'm not boring you. I hope this really gets us to appropriate, lay hold of what he has actually put inside of us. The ability to mature and release all that he is. Far too often in the crevices, this is what I talked about it just the other day, is the spirit of unbelief in the dark areas. And this is why there has to be an awakening to get rid of the things that we hoard without even knowing it. This is why he says meditate. The word will clip. The word will wash. The word, look, we are washed by the what? Water of the word. Eat, meditate, chew, become clean. The whole point of becoming clean, listen, seriously, is to become whole. He is the spotless one. 
And his desire is to bring forth a spotless, without blame, church. How does that get done? Washing, cleansing, clipping. Well, I thought Jesus did that once and for all. He did that and came into your life. You have to be born of the water and the spirit. And now the Holy Ghost brings that life to a full, mature visibility. Out of the intangible into the tangible. Out of the invisible into the visible. The things that are visible, they're what? Temporal. But the things that are invisible are eternal. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. Who was the prey? Adam. Right? My son, thou art gone up. Didn't he arise? What's he after in a people? Judah, overcomer. See, we have to understand this. Like, listen, I, I told you my story. Judah prevailed amongst, uh, over all of his brethren, and Joseph held the birthright. Just being born again. There's more to it. Have to mature, have to overcome. Look at, he stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Look, you know what, that, what he's trying to say? Is he's already sitting on the throne, he's already victorious, he's already overcome, he's already released all that he is, and nobody can get higher than him. Nobody. It's a name, a nature, above every other. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Like, listen, we're not talking the natural aspect at all. The scepter, the king, the king, the king, the king of kings, nor a lawgiver, law of the spirit, between his feet, a walk, a lifestyle, until Shiloh come. You know what Shiloh, it just means tranquil. You know, when I hear that word, I think of what? Peace. Jerusalem. A habitation of peace. This is a place. It's a gathering of the people. All God ever wanted was a people of peace. No, that's all he ever wanted, didn't he? Do you think Adam's a people of peace? Do you know what James says when we fight in war amongst ourselves? It's because of what's inside of us. It's that double... It's that bitter well. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass to uh, uh, his ass is cold unto the choice vine. I love these words. I just love them. I, I just love them. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. He poured out his life, didn't he? He's victorious. If we went to the, if we went. Uh, if we went to other places, we would find out that he, con in Isaiah, right? If we, if we read that whole thing where his, all of his clothing was trampled. He, he was a conqueror. He was victorious. He, if we went to Colossians, we would see that he triumphed over everything. He subdued it. That life. That life. This is, like, I, I, I know that I'm not doing a very good job tonight of a, a, getting your attention of what he's really after. That life, that victorious life that he put inside of us, he's asking you and I appropriate it because the creation groans. It desires. It no longer has a sense to satisfy the sensual needs of Adam. The sad part is most of the Christians spend all their time doing that. And God's called us to come high. Appropriate. Your teeth. Now watch, here we go. His eyes shall be red with wine. Like, all right, oh, you got drunk. No, no. The cool thing is this word red is it's the only place it's found anywhere in the Bible. And it literally means to be dark, dark flashing, in a good sense, brilliant. His eyes. His perception, his insight, his understanding. It's 
brilliant. It's full. This is what he's after in our life. And this is what he wants. And he says, and his teeth, his teeth, white, with or from, because it's literally the word out of or from. It even, even that word, if you look in it, it literally means above. And I love this word, milk. It's not the same thought as, look, you ought to be teachers. You still need milk. Even when, when uh, Peter said this, desire the sincere word, milk of the word, is what he said. What he was trying to get you to understand was not about milk, but what he was saying is be like a baby. That's the only thing they want. And in those days, they didn't have bottles. So it gives us the idea that it comes from the mother, the new Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all, right? This word milk, I love it. It means milk as the richness of kind. Like, it flows with what? Milk and honey, okay? And it literally means, it comes from a word that means to be fat, Whenever God talks about being fat in this context, what he's talking about is wealth, rich, enough, full, complete, fat. Whether literally or figuratively, hence the richest or the choice part. His teeth were washed. In other words, he became clean, pure, and holy with the best part, with milk, the choice part. Give me your heart. That's all he wants. Because then he can release what he's after. Father, help us, God. Love you, Jesus. Take the word. Let it be a glory unto your name. Once again, God, we say thank you for watching over us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.